Good morning. I'm Russell Myers, CEO of Midland Health, and this is our coronavirus update for Monday, April 13th, 2020. I'll begin today by reporting some sad news. Uh, we did have the second death uh, here at the hospital and in Midland County. Uh, a patient, a female patient in her 70s died yesterday here in the hospital. That's the second death in Midland County. Uh, larger statistics, um, looking at the whole state, we've had over 124,000 patients tested in the state of Texas. 13,500 of those have been confirmed positive. There have been 271 deaths now in the state as of this morning's update from the Department of State Health Services. In Midland County, the uh, department reports 32 cases and now two deaths. The hospital census information uh, remains very, very limited uh, for this time of year. 112 inpatients as of this morning, only 42% occupancy in the hospital. Uh, in our emergency department, we saw 84 patients yesterday, continuing our, our now long trend of, of fairly low volume in the ER. Uh, in critical care, we have 16 patients today. Uh, our patients under investigation uh, there are five in critical care and six in the medical surgical environment for a total of just 11 persons under investigation. Two of those are confirmed positive. Uh, ventilator use uh, of our 44 available ventilators, uh, full service ventilators, we have six in use today, six out of 44 in use. Testing, uh, the hospital has uh, continued to, to operate its offsite testing center. Uh, now 778 tests have been gathered uh, from uh, individuals presenting at that location. 726 of those have been reported negative. 36 positives, uh, that includes uh, several that were tested multiple times. And we're down to a backlog of only 16 cases uh, outstanding as of today. So uh, testing turnaround has, has gotten better and continued to, to perform pretty well. Uh, one thing that's uh, important to note as we go into this week, uh, <clears throat> there is a good bit of conversation happening at both the national and the state level about the, the possibilities, the opportunities for getting back to something that resembles normal life. Um, that's, that includes regular work, it includes the possibility of a return to doing some elective cases in the hospital. Uh, I'd like to, to emphasize today that just today is just April 13th. Uh, we have a good bit of April left to go, in fact almost three full weeks. Uh, none of the conversations you're hearing now are talking about anything but May. Uh, so if we're talking and thinking about beginning to get back to something that resembles normal life. Uh, remember, this is a particularly crucial week uh, as we, some of the models that are outstanding show peaking in the, the nation and in the state of Texas, either this week or the following week. Uh, but all of those models assume we will continue to do the social distancing that has become a part of our habit uh, through the month of May. Uh, so we, we here at the hospital are not uh, immune from that. We've begun some very early conversations about what a return to normal work might look like. Uh, those conversations have a long way to go yet. Uh, and we are also thinking about several weeks away before we are ready to, to return to anything resembling normalcy. Uh, so remember, this is a crucial week. Uh, continue to do social distancing. Uh, don't uh, allow the, the nice weather and the beginning of discussions about a return to normal um, allow us to get ahead of ourselves uh, and rush that process uh, too aggressively. Um, one last thing I would like to do is uh, give some particular thanks today to the people here in the room with me. Uh, as we have put together these daily briefings, we've been through multiple different formats. Uh, different technology has been used. We've been in different locations. And throughout all of that, our personal, our public relations and marketing team and our HIS team have been very flexible, very creative, uh, helping to make the technology work and assure that we can get good information to our public, 
and our media uh, every day and, and as effectively and consistently as possible. Thanks also to Dr. Larry Wilson and Dr. Kit Bredemus who have helped me with the clinical side of these briefings each day uh, and have routinely been, uh, <coughs> been available to me, but also engaged 24-7 uh, in managing this pandemic and the hospital's response to it. So thanks to all of you, uh, and a particular shout out to our marketing and information technology teams. Uh, and I hope this is a good week, continue social distancing, uh, and we look forward to uh, the continued downturn of the coronavirus infections uh, towards something that resembles normalcy perhaps as soon as next month. Uh, at this point, that's the end of my prepared marks and I'll be happy to address questions. While we're waiting on questions, I will uh, add a, a quick apology. We had a little bit of technical difficulty on Friday. Um, we believe we've worked that out uh, as, as Facebook has changed its uh, platform for doing live video feeds. Um, uh, we, we think we're up to speed on that today. Um, thank you all for your patience. Do we seem to be flattening the curve here in Midland? When are our cases projected to peak now? Well, uh, the question about flattening the curve is, it's hard to know. We need, we need more days of, of, uh, of trending to be certain of that. We certainly are at, a low, at the low end of our inpatient census of, pers of uh, persons under investigation as we stand right now. Um, too soon for us to know if that's a trend yet or not. Uh, I checked the um, IHME model that, that comes from the University of Washington just this morning before I came in. Uh, and that model indicates that we peaked uh, two days ago in the nation, but it has now peaked, pushed the Texas peak out to April 26th. Um, so as, as you all have become uh, aware over uh, recent weeks, each of these models is continually adjusted uh, based on the, the reality on the ground and the places where the, the outbreak is the worst. Uh, and so it's a bit of a moving target. I would say for us, it is, uh, it's at least a week too soon to say that we have peaked, uh, but we'll be watching it every day and, and we'll try to give you an update um, as, as we begin to see anything that resembles a trend. We have a question from Caitlin Randall from the MRT. What's the earliest you believe elective surgeries could be resumed? Uh, Caitlin, that's a very good question. And I, I don't honestly know. I, I have been, in my own mind, I've been thinking in terms of a, a slow uh, and steady ramp up. Uh, most likely, uh, hopefully, most hopefully, I would say, not most likely, but most hopefully, uh, back to something that resembles uh, full speed by sometime in May. Uh, in the meantime, we'll be talking to our surgeons and our anesthesia providers about loosening the, the rules a little bit at a time, uh, trying to get those most urgent but not quite emergent cases uh, done uh, sooner, uh, working our way through specialty by specialty and, and uh, uh, area of the hospital, uh, one area of the hospital at a time to try to be sure that we don't overwhelm our uh, current social distancing uh, expectations that we're careful about continuing to preserve PPE. Um, we, we're trying to be very, very thoughtful about this and not just open the doors and, and go full speed from day one. So realistically, I think we're still uh, two or three weeks away from loosening those restrictions and, and a good month or more away from, from anything that resembles normalcy. And of course that depends on the continued decline of infections in our community. We have a question from Facebook. Can you please tell us in what ways are we more prepared for an inevitable second wave when it hits and does the testing indicate very limited community spread before the lockdown? So the first question is um, in what ways are we better prepared for an inevitable second wave? Um, I, I don't know if a second wave is inevitable. I would say most people that I've heard from uh, would say it's likely, but not all. 
Uh, and in what ways are we better prepared is certainly an easier question for me to answer. We've done a variety of things here at the hospital uh, that have made us better prepared in the near term and certainly in the longer term. Uh, number one, we're learning a lot from this process. We, we learned that our stockpiles of personal protective equipment need to be bigger uh, in the future and we'll continue to, to work to accumulate more personal protective equipment so that when the next uh, pandemic event hits, no matter if, this, if it's this virus or another, uh, we'll be better prepared with the most difficult to source items of personal protective equipment like N95 masks. Uh, we have also had great creative work uh, between our clinical and our engineering teams to ready the facility to do more with the space that we have uh, than we've done in the past. Uh, one of the great gifts of the, the Scarborough Tower construction funded by donors and taxpayers in our community was that we built a large building that's got expansion capability and by and large is universally constructed. So we can go from one unit to another, enhancing the critical care capability uh, in the hospital. Um, we built 48 beds of critical care when we first opened, but we already have a plan in place to add 12 more beds on another floor. The rooms being designed essentially all alike really gives us a lot of flexibility. and We've learned how to use that flexibility uh, here in the immediate term and we'll apply that in the future. Uh, one more thing we're doing that's, that's got significant impact is building out the last of the empty space in the Scarborough Tower, the ninth floor. Uh, has been shelled. That's 48 additional beds of capacity. Uh, we've begun the process of building that out. We won't have it finished um, in, in time for the current uh, experience we're having, uh, but we, somewhere between September and December, we're still negotiating with the contractor on possible acceleration, but before the end of this year, uh, we'll have a whole additional floor of beds available so that our capacity is higher. And if we have another spike, uh, we'll be much better prepared. So we're learning, uh, our staff is becoming accustomed to dealing with, well, with the realities of an infectious disease that we don't completely understand and we need to carefully, carefully manage exposure within the hospital. Uh, and we're expanding capacity pretty significantly uh, in anticipation that this could happen again. We have another question from Facebook. Do you know how the group from MCS is doing and has there been any reported cases in the nursing or retirement homes? Um, I just asked them to clarify who MCS, what they mean by MCS. It's Midland Christian, the students that traveled oh, to Spain. All right, all right thank you. Uh, Midland Christian School, I guess you mean. And I, I don't know anything about that. I'm sorry, I haven't had, had an update of, about the, the middle and Christian school team that, that uh, came back after spring break. Uh, that seems like a long time ago, <laughs> honestly. And it's, it's sort of been off my, off the front of my mind. Uh, Tasa, could you repeat the other part of the question, please? Yes, sir. Has there been any reported cases in the nursing or retirement homes? Um, let's see. Have there been any reported cases in nursing homes? I don't, I'm not aware of any. That might be a better question for the health department just to be certain uh, because they would not likely have come through our testing center, but I don't remember hearing of a, of a specifically reported case in a nursing center that was confirmed. Oh, okay. We have a question from the media from Mitch Borden. Okay. Did the woman who passed away on the 12th have any underlying conditions? Uh, thank you for that question, Mitch. Uh, I've given you all the information that I have, uh, as, as happened with our, our initial death in the community. The, the family has asked that we not share further data, so um, all I can tell you is it was a female in her 70s, uh, and she did die in the hospital. We have another question from Mitch. Has Midland Memorial began to see more patients exhibiting symptoms of COVID-19 coming in from other outlying communities in the Permian Basin? For example, Pecos, Andrews, Crane, or Mentone? Uh, question about people from other communities. Um, we certainly throughout the process have uh, tested people from all over the region. We, we don't turn any away from our testing center. 
Uh, I think you know that we have published our 6-8 nurse phone number and encouraged people to use it for screening purposes. Uh, and if you meet the screening criteria, you get referred to our testing center regardless of where you live. Um, so while I wouldn't say that we've necessarily seen a spike from those communities, we have had people from, from all over this region come to our testing center uh, throughout this, this period of the pandemic. Okay, that seems to be all the questions. I'll repeat myself. Uh, this is a crucial week. Uh, the weather's nice. We're past Easter. Uh, it feels like we should have the, the fetters off and, and return to normal life. And I'll encourage you to recognize that it's too soon. Uh, this month of April is crucial. This week is crucial. Please maintain social distancing. Wear your mask in public. Wash your hands. Um, stay home uh, if at all possible. Uh, if you get sick, stay home. If you get sick enough that you're concerned about your symptoms, call 68 Nurse and we'll walk you through the protocol and um, refer you for testing if you need it. Uh, please maintain our, our social distancing restrictions uh, and I'll see you again tomorrow from the Unified Command Team. Thank you very much. <laughs>